Okay, thank, thank you very much. And uh, my thanks to Xiao and Umberto for inviting me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's my first time in uh, Natal, second time in Brazil. I'm mainly here this week attending uh, a meeting in the Physics Institute about uh, quantum contextuality and related topics. But uh, um, I'm going to talk here about things I've been interested in for many years in the theory of computation, um, which I think continue to be very challenging questions for the field of computer science. So in particular, ideas connected with intentionality and how they're reflected in the world of computation. So um, what is intentionality? Well, we'll sort of see soon, but it's uh, roughly speaking. By the way, incidentally, let me say, I, I guess the, the audience sort of is, you know, may have varied background. I, I don't know, you know, some of you may be familiar with this or that or whatever, so I'm happy if you have questions, please ask them while I'm talking, and I'm happy to answer anything, and if anything needs more explanation, uh, to uh, try and provide it. But I think most of what I'll say will hopefully be uh, a level of sort of general interest for people interested in fundamental principles of computer science. So intentionality is to do with, uh, well, it's, 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 it's always, it's been around in a long time in the history of logic. Um, it's to do with the way things are described. So from a computer science point of view, we have a program and there are the things that are purely about the behavior that the program produces that we can observe when we use the program. That, that's what we would think of as the extensional information. But on the other hand, there's the things, so in other words, viewing the program as a black box. That's the extensional point of view. Um, but uh, everything else, the way the program is written, the number of lines of code, the, um, uh, you know, the names of the procedures and all these kind of little details, all of that potentially could be part of an intentional description of the program. So with that general, and, and the same idea can be found in, uh, in logic. Um, in fact, for, from the perspective of logic, intentionality has always been seen as a difficult and exotic concept. But actually, if we come to it uh, from a computational perspective, I think uh, we more or less can't avoid it and it becomes very natural. And I want to particularly talk about one um, uh, area where there's been, I think, some success in giving a, a kind of intentional semantics for um, a part of, an important part of computation, uh, functional computation as we find it in modern functional programming languages. Um, and it led to uh, progress on uh, some well-known uh, open problems in the field of programming language semantics. So there was this sort of a classic of the area called the full abstraction problem for PCF. Um, and uh, some progress that was made there using ideas in, in, in game semantics by a, a number of people. I'll, I'll try and talk a bit about that. Um, and in addition, uh, I just want to sort of mention that I think intentional recursion and related ideas potentially a very powerful method for computer science, which have hardly been exploited to this point. So I think it's something that has a lot of potential for future work. So the message in some sense is that intentionality should be viewed not as a bug, but as a feature, which is after all the great slogan of uh, computer science, right? So um, what is, well, it's much easier to say what extensionality is. Actually, if you learn and if you take any course in set theory or in logic, you learn axioms for extensionality. It's a basic part of the subject. So extensionality as a sort of positive statement, you have axioms that express extensional behavior. So here is the most best known one, the axiom of extensionality for sets, which is one of the basic things that you learn if you learn a system of axiomatic set theory. So it tells you when two sets are equal, um, uh, and they're equal exactly when they have the same members. Uh, for any z, z is a member of one if it's a member of the other. And what this is really saying, in a sense, is that, again, think of a set as a kind of a black box. The only question you can ask of this black box is which members does it have? Is for a given element, is it actually a member of this set or not? 
So it's really saying if two sets behave the same with respect to these membership questions, then they are the same. So that's a nice, powerful, simple statement, which you actually need if you sort of actually develop any amount of set theory or use this all the time implicitly. And there's also uh, a very well-known, uh, equally familiar axiom of extensionality for functions. Uh, when are two functions the same? When for all possible inputs, they give you the same possible outputs. Um, by the way, I mean, in the history of mathematics, a very ancient subject, uh, this axiom wasn't really clarified till a surprisingly late point. Um, so uh, the idea, because this is really saying a function is determined by its graph, by its set of input-output correspondences. And this wasn't really clarified in mathematics till quite late on in the 19th century. Um, before then, people tended to think of functions as given by rules. And actually, from a modern computer science perspective, we may still think of functions as naturally given by rules, because of course we care about how efficiently the function is computed. And this is saying we're going to ignore that, we're only going to look at this black box behavior again, and we say that two functions are equal if they have the same observable behavior in this sense. So that's what this axiom is saying. Now, the thing is, um, if we want to say what intentionality is, the tempting thing, which is not very promising, is to say that intentionality is whatever is not this. So is it just a failure to satisfy such properties? And I think a lot of the kind of bad press that uh, intentionality has received is because of a sort of the, the feeling that, that it was just this failure to satisfy these nice, elegant axioms, and it was just a mess, and one couldn't do anything with it. But by contrast, one might hope that there is some positive story to tell about intentionality and also, of course, some reasons for being interested in such a story. So let me um, go a little bit further with this and suggest that, that um, a sort of part of, closely allied to this concept of uh, intentional versus extensional, um, we can have this idea about uh, properties of functions being extrinsic or, sorry, intrinsic or extrinsic. So extrinsic is the opposite of intrinsic. Um, and the curious thing is that the most fundamental notion in computer science is the notion of computability. And computability isn't defined the way that most, which is a property of functions and sets and so on, but it's not defined in the way that most natural mathematical properties of functions are defined. So what do I mean by an intrinsic property of functions? So a property of functions we can say is intrinsic if it can be defined purely in terms of f, the function itself, from this extensional point of view, a set of input-output pairs, together with any structure which, which the, the um, types, the input type and the output type of the function may have. So. Um, some basic example, if you think of any kind of algebraic structure, the notion of a homomorphism is intrinsic in this sense. I mean, you can say when a, when a function is a homomorphism, if it preserves the operation, the algebraic operations of the kind of structure it's dealing with. And similarly, if we're in the world of continuous functions, uh, then continuity will be, this, will be defined in the same way. Also, things like being differentiable or... Um, uh, other such natural mathematical properties. So this is, from a point of view of um, the way one learns uh, mathematics, this is the natural and standard thing. And the point I want to make, a, a very simple one, but I think actually, in some sense, a, a, a deep one, a, a pointing to a deep lack of understanding, is that computability is not an intrinsic property of functions on the natural numbers. I mean, usually, if you read a, a sort of, a, if, you, if you read about computability of its, uh, the, first, the basic discussion is about partial functions for, on the natural numbers. Um, and the notion of computability is not intrinsic in this sense. It's of a very different nature. So um, in order to define whether a function is computable, we need to refer to something external which is outside the function and the data and the, the, the input type and the output type. We have to refer to a process by means of which f is computed. So a function is computable if there's some algorithmic process that computes f. 
And of course, that's fine, but then we, we're going to ask what computable process. Now, um, uh, Zhao has a nice t-shirt with Alan Turing on it, and uh, so in Turing's famous paper from 1936, I guess, he gave um, a remarkable analysis of what it is to be a computable process, um, which was, um, and which actually, had, for example, had a profound um, influence on Kurt Gödel, who was kind of, who sort of said something like, before this analysis by Turing, I didn't think that one could give precise characterizations of informal concepts. Um, and his, he was sort of really convinced by this at the time, although maybe later on there were, there were some more disagreements. There's also a very deep analysis by, uh, by Turing's um, uh, friend and uh, um, uh, colleague Robin Gandhi um, at a later time. But the thing is that the story is um, uh, by no means um, in as good a form as one might hope. There is no single canonical form of external structure witnessing computability. What we have is what's often called a confluence of notions. That is, we have Turing machines, we have random access machines, we have Kolmogorov type graph processing machines, we have string rewriting systems, and many other models of computation. And they sort of, fortunately enough, as was realized at a fairly early stage, they all lead you to the same class of functions. But we don't have a sort of general principles from which we can see why it was that when people tried to describe these notions, they ended up with the same thing. But anyway, this leads to the church Turing thesis that this notion given originally in Church's case by the Lambda Calculus and, and, and then uh, Turing machines, uh, is, is, gives the canonical notion of what computable functions are. But it's still something that stands outside the objects that, that we're saying are computable. So people knew about functions a long time before. Well, actually, they did computations. But picking out the computable functions uh, needs this extra machinery. Well, um, and just to put this more concretely, so if you really think of a function that you're computing, you're given some input string, which is a binary string, and maybe it's just a decision process, you're going to give out 0 or 1, accepting or not accepting a binary string. So what I'm saying, the point I'm making, the elementary point I'm making, is that we can't say if f is computable just by looking at its uh, input-output graph and properties relating to the structure of its domain, its input set, and its output set. Uh, we need something more, um, which uh, we have to sort of bring in. Um, and you might say, well, you know, okay, that, that's, but that's surely the only reasonable thing. How could we do better anyway? So I just want to give an example, also well known in computer science, in a much simpler case where we do have a better kind of answer. We do have a better kind of answer here. Uh, and this is for the case of regular languages, the kind of languages that are described by regular expressions or accepted by finite automata. So things that are really used a lot in computer science. And here's, here's the famous characterization of regular languages, the, the myhill narod theorem, as it's usually called, which, which can be said to be an intrinsic uh, characterization of when a language is regular. In other words, you only need to look at the language and the structure of the actual strings that you're dealing with. So here I'm just, for simplicity, considering binary strings again, but it could be over any alpha, finite alphabet, of course. So the idea is you define this equivalence relation, this myhill narod congruence, uh, by uh, just given the, the data of the language itself. You say two strings are congruent, if uh, whatever you, whenever you concatenate a string on one side, you can also do it on, on the sort of two-sided symmetric version, but this is a standard form. Uh, whenever you, you concatenate some string on the end, for one, you end up in the language if and only if um, uh, you do with the other. And then the myhill narod theorem is that the language is regular if and only if this relation has finite index, meaning there are only finitely many different equivalence classes under this relation. And actually, from this data, from this relation, you can build 
the canonical minima, minima, um, minimal automaton that realizes the language. So it's a beautiful construction, and, and it is intrinsic in the sense that we're looking for. So the, what we can ask is, well, you know, why can't we do as well as we do for, fi for regular languages for the computable functions? Of course, it's a much harder problem, but is there some metamathematical reason why we can't hope to do as well for computable functions? And actually, I've never seen this really discussed in the, uh, in the literature, and it would be nice to have a better understanding of this rather elementary point. So that's what I want to say about that, but it, it tells us that we, we, in particular, that we don't have um, an, an intrinsic definition of computability. So now I want to do something that may seem a bit strange, um, which is rather than sort of trying to solve the problem for functions, to move to something that looks more complicated, namely functionals, in other words, higher order functions. The reason why, I mean, uh, you know, it's amazing you can't solve the problem in the simple case and so then move to a more complicated case. Why, why is that a good idea? Well, the thing is that uh, if we include functionals in our discussion, we get more structure. And once we get more structure, we can actually begin to have some principles that go a long way, not all the way, but a long way towards pinning down what are, what are the reasonable computable processes. And this actually led historically to a beautiful development in the theory of computation, particularly associated with Dana Scott. So what do I mean by these higher order functions? So we have, we have the basic type of computation, say, is the natural numbers. The type 1 functions are just the usual kinds of things, mappings from natural numbers to natural numbers. But now I can have type 2, which takes as input these uh, functions and gives me back a natural number and so on. And actually, these higher order functions, well, firstly, if you uh, use a functional, uh, so as a matter of interest here, I mean, uh, so how many people have used a functional programming language? So, quite a number. So, I, I, yeah, so it's tempting to ask what are the most popular ones, but let's not get into, into that. Uh, um, but anyway, if you used a functional language, then you will have used higher order functions. And actually, even the things one encounters in a basic course in logic, like the quantifiers, are, can really be seen as um, um, second order functions. So if you think of a predicate on, say, on the natural numbers as, as, as something that takes a natural number as input, returns a Boolean as output, um, then um, uh, quantifying over a predicate is, is going to take you from a function like this just to uh, a Boolean. Uh, I, so, for example, the universal one takes the predicate and returns true if the predicate is true for all inputs and false otherwise. So what it amounts to is computing with a function parameter. And um, when we compute with a function parameter, then actually the black box idea that we, we've been mentioning becomes very natural. And this is really the extensional paradigm. We're coming back now to our main topic about contrasting extensionality and intentionality. So the black box paradigm, when you have a procedure parameter, is really treated as a black box. And the only way we can interact with it is to call it on some arguments and use the results. So we, we call it on some input n, we, we collect the output, say, m, and then we can do this, obviously, in the course of producing um, an output, we can only do this a finite number of times if we're going to terminate the computation in a finite amount of time. And what we've done then is to observe a finite subset of the graph of the function defined by this procedure. So here are the finitely many calls, and each one of them gives us one piece of the graph of the, of the function. Uh, so that, that's a very natural notion of finite information that we're dealing with. So that's the extensional paradigm. Uh, and actually, mostly in programming, we try to restrict ourselves to the extensional paradigm. Let's take a look at the intentional paradigm briefly. You see, whereas in logic it was a bit mysterious, in the case of programming, it's actually very clear. The intentional paradigm means we have access to the code of P. So we can compute such things as the code itself or how many symbols appear in it and so on. 
And actually, there are lots of useful programs that do exactly this. For example, interpreters, compilers, program analyzers, um, pretty printers, all sorts of things like that. Um, so it's not unreasonable, but uh, we tend to make a sharp distinction between when we view programs as data and have them processed by other programs, and when we view programs as things that actually run when we take this black box approach. The reason being, essentially, the programming is difficult enough anyway, and we don't want to complicate things by, by having programs that kind of stick fingers inside the code of um, procedures that they're calling. Now, uh, coming back to our, our sort of theme of, of trying to get a handle on, on, on computability, when we go to this, this view of higher order functions, we do see some intrinsic structure that begins to emerge. I mean, some sense if we're just computing over the natural numbers or some discrete data like that, there's nothing really to get our hands on. We have to go to some machine description. But when we go to higher order functions, some intrinsic structure emerges, um, which um, gives us some access to principles for computation which can work at this more abstract level. So in particular, there's a natural ordering on partial functions. It's often called the information ordering. So we say that f approximates g, or the information about f is contained in the information in g, just if the graph of f is a subset of the graph of g. Remember, these are partial functions. So you, so you may have functions that are not defined on all inputs. So this is exactly referring to the sort of information we could collect in this way by treating a, a procedure parameter as a black box. We're, we're getting some piece of its graph. And here we have a beautiful result from the history of computability, which shows that one, once we go to the level of functionals, we really get some nice mathematical properties which, which, which follow from computability and actually, with a little bit extra, exactly characterize computability. This is the myhill shepherdson theorem. So this is talking about computable functionals and, and, and actually specifically extensional ones, so which really means that they, they don't depend on the code of their input. They, uh, as long as the input is defining the same function, they give you the same output. And they, they give us two very important properties, which by virtue of computability, such, um, such uh, functionals must satisfy. And they both really follow from this finite information way that we compute with function, with procedure parameters as black boxes, which we were talking about here. Um, the first one is monotonicity. If I get more, if I have more information about, if there's more information about G than about F, if we came to a decision on the basis just of the information in F to get, produce some output, we would have come to the same decision about G. Because after all, what can you do with f or g? You could just call them and observe input-output correspondences. And if the input-output correspondences you saw from f were sufficient to give you an output, then certainly those from g, which has all the same ones and possibly more, would have led to the same conclusion. So, so in other words, we don't know really what f and g are. All we know about them is what we learn by treating them in this black box way and calling them some finite number of times. So that's monotonicity. And then the, the second property is continuity, which is really about finiteness of information. And it's saying that we never need to look at an infinite amount of information about our input in order to produce an output in a finite amount of time. And this is really, it's almost like a physical principle for computability. Continuity is really saying physically, if we're processing information in this discrete way, to get, uh, to, we can only see a finite amount of information uh, in, a, in, a, in a finite amount of time. So therefore, what we get in the limit is nothing more than we could have got by collecting uh, all the information we get at finite stages. So these are two beautiful and important properties which could be derived for um, uh, computable function, extensional computable functionals. And Michael Shepardson even proved a converse. However, the, the, the sting in the tail with the converse is you need to come back to our church Turing thesis and the usual notion of computability just for ordinary functions in order to get a converse. But then under that 
hypothesis, the converse is telling you that if uh, an extensional functional is monotonic and continuous and is kind of realized in a suitable way by a, by a computable function, then um, 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 then uh, that, um, that gives you exactly the computable functionals. Okay, so this was uh, for a particular case of the second order functions computing over the natural numbers, and this result by Michael and Shepardson goes back to the 1950s. And these ideas were elaborated into a beautiful and extensive mathematical theory of computation by a number of people, but above all, uh, the leading figure was uh, Dana Scott. Um, so this, this led to a, a much more, uh, and this led to the same ideas being put into a much more general setting. So we, we, you saw that we had partial orders and we had these ideas of monotonicity and continuity. And the idea is to uh, put this into a much more general setting where you can have abstract data types which still have this structure of partial orders and where the functions are still monotonic and continuous. Now notice that these are clearly intrinsic properties in the sense that we were discussing earlier. So this is really fitting into the way we would like to define our properties uh, of functions. Actually, uh, the, the fact that computable things should be continuous is sometimes referred to as Scott's thesis, um, sort of a bit like an, an, an analog um, on a, of the church Turing thesis. Um, so we can say that continuity serves as an intrinsic ap approximation to computability, but it doesn't do the whole thing. There's still the, this extra thing where we have to come back to this notion at first order that still, in some sense, doesn't remain fully analyzed. Just to give a, a sort of little feel for um, monotonicity and continuity, we're looking at predicates over streams, binary streams. So this is, as you may have in a lazy functional language, you have a stream of zeros and ones, which may go on forever. Um, and, you, and you want to define a predicate on these things, which maps into the Booleans, but may be undefined somewhere. Um, and if we think, of, we think of these examples of such predicates, then um, if we search for, for, for a one in the string somewhere, and we return true if we find the one and undefined otherwise, then this is, this is perfectly fine. This is actually monotonic and continuous. If you, so the idea of, of, of the ordering on the streams is that if one stream is kind of um, doesn't produce any information beyond a certain point, then it will approximate any other stream that produces all that information and continues on and produces more information. So um, if we're just looking for a one and produce true when we see the one and otherwise produce nothing, then we're certainly monotonic. If we saw a one and, and produced true, and then we, had, we fed in a longer stream, we would still see the one and still produce true. And it's even continuous because uh, we're, we're only, we're only produce some defined output if we see a one somewhere at some finite stage in the stream. So this, this property of continuity is bound to be satisfied. But you can see that but the second one, um, which comes to a definite conclusion on the basis of, you know, the, the, the stream goes on forever and there's never a one. That is still monotonic, but it's definitely not continuous because we only produce this false here after we've seen all the infinite information of an infinite string of zeros. So no finite string of zeros is enough to get us to produce false because we might still see a one. So it, it fails to be continuous because we, we're producing defined information uh, on the basis of an infinite amount of information in the input. And the final one is actually uh, not even monotonic. And, you, and, and actually, if you think about this one, which um, is able to detect a defined answer even if no information is forthcoming from the input, really is representing a, a kind of uh, world in which we could solve the halting problem. Uh, so we can return, we, we know in some sense we, even if the, if the input runs forever producing no information, uh, we're supposed to produce a definite defined answer. And the conceptual basis for these properties is that this information we're talking about here is positive. It's something we actually see and that's produced 
whereas negative information is not regarded as stable in observable information. So if we're at some information state S, for example, we've generated some part of a binary stream, then for all we know, S may still produce more, may still increase, and that means that if we, if we decide to produce information F of S at S, then we must produce all this information and possibly more at T. Um, so we can only make decisions at a given information state which are stable under every possible information increase from that state. And if you've encountered Kripke semantics, particularly for intuitionistic logic, this is really the same idea that we find there. And the continuity condition is really this finiteness point that a computational process will only have access to a finite amount of information at each finite stage of the, of the computation. So, um, so I think we've, uh, we've said that already. If we're provided with an infinite input, any information we produce as output at a finite stage can only depend on some finite information we've made of the input. And this gives us the extra property that gives us continuity in the sense that we defined it. So these are very powerful principles and they are intrinsic properties of these functions. And another beautiful thing that comes out of uh, this analysis is a very general way of understanding recursion, which is one of the really, of course, the powerful primitives that leads to the power of computable functions because we can analyze uh, recursion through the fixed point theorem. Once we have these continuous functions, then uh, we always have these least fixed points which give us the canonical semantics for uh, recursion. And this has been a very powerful tool in giving the semantics of programming language. So it provides the basis for interpreting recursive definitions of all kinds. So this is really a beautiful story developed originally, well, Yershov was involved at an early stage, but really decisively by Dana Scott, originally with his models of the lambda calculus, starting from the late 60s and early 70s, leading to the development of denotational semantics and many other developments, and uh, there's still active uh, work to, uh, to this day. So it seems great, but, you know, as we know, um, um, there's always some... Um, uh, some thorn in the rose uh, and uh, some trouble in paradise. So although this story seems compelling, there is a problem. And the problem is that there's a mismatch between what the semantic theory allows and what we can actually compute in natural programming languages. And if you've programmed in any of the standard functional languages, be it, I don't know, Haskell, um, OCaml, F sharp, um, whatever, I don't know, Lisp, um, Scheme, uh, this will be uh, quite tangible. So here is a famous example. I mean, it's maybe a bit artificial, but it's simple and it makes the point. The so-called parallel or. So this is taking a function that takes a pair of booleans, and it's supposed to compute the or of booleans in the usual truth table sense. But we have to now deal with a situation that, in general, we're dealing with partial functions and our inputs may be undefined and our outputs might be undefined, depending on how much information we have in our inputs. And, of course, we're operating under the constraints of these beautiful principles of uh, monotonicity and continuity. Uh, so uh, what can we do with uh, we're taking our usual truth table function for the OR and turning it into a monotonic and continuous function. Um, and it turns out that uh, there's a sort of maximal, most defined um, answer to this question, which lives in this mathematical universe as defined by, by Scott and, in, and standing in this tradition of denotational semantics. And this is the so-called parallel or. So if you think about it, um, or should be true as soon as one of its arguments is true. So it doesn't matter what the other argument is, and even if we have no information about the other argument, we shouldn't, as it were, need to wait for the argument. We should say, OK, I'm ready to output true. And that's what the parallel or does. And it's only when we, we, have, to, we only have to output false when we know that both arguments are false. So that's what the parallel or does. This also is an, this 
operation goes back to Kleene, the founder of uh, main founder of, rec of recursion theory or computability theory, with his uh, three-valued logic for computable functions. So this is the parallel or it's it's a perfectly good monotonic and continuous function. It lives in this mathematical universe. But there's only one um, little problem here. So for anyone who's used a functional language, how would you implement this in your favorite functional language? Could you implement this in your favorite functional language? Does anyone see a problem? Or does anyone think they could do it? So if I'm given a function with two arguments, what do I usually have to do? I have to choose one to evaluate first. Sorry? Order. Evaluation order, yes. So we, we have a definite evaluation order. And it's clear that no, exactly. So, so we have an, we, we, I mean, any actual language will, will have an evaluation order. And we'll have to choose one of these arguments to evaluate first. And you can see that there's no choice that we can make which is guaranteed to produce this result. If I chose to evaluate the first argument first, it would fail in this case. And if I chose to evaluate the second argument first, it would fail in this case. So um, a sequential functional language will not be able to um, compute this function. And, and, I, and in practice, I mean, people might think about implementing functional languages on a parallel architecture, but they nevertheless don't implement this. What we would have to do is run two processes in parallel, one to try and evaluate the first argument and one to try and evaluate the second argument. And as soon as one of them succeeded to, and returned true, we would kill the other process and return true. That would work, but no actual implementation of a real functional language does this. It's not, in some sense, relevant sense, it's not the natural thing to do. So. Uh, um, Yes, OK. Uh, so the point is that this function lives perfectly well in the semantic model. It lives, in, it lives in paradise, but it's not definable in realistic languages or those arising from logical calculi or the lambda calculus. Uh, and this mismatch, I mean, with some elaboration, is what's known as the failure of full abstraction, which was seen as one of the major issues in programming language semantics going back to the uh, 1970s. So, I mean, just to make the contrast, here are some variants which are perfectly well definable in your favorite functional language. I mean, we just define them with conditionals. Here's the so-called left strict or, which chooses to evaluate the first argument first. So we choose that evaluation order, and that's fine. And we can similarly have a right strict or, and they will have these properties. Where they, which will be less well-defined in general, strictly less well-defined than the parallel law. Um, and by the way, I mean, if we're going to sort of have to run these processes in parallel, you see this brings us back to the world of intentionality. We need to have access not just to the purely extensional information about the arguments, in other words, their values, but about their intentional descriptions, namely the programs that are going to evaluate them, because we have to kind of interleave or run in parallel those, those uh, pieces of code. So the problem is the, the finite number of processors at the end of the Sorry? The, the problem is the finite, num the finite number of processors. Um, but I, well, I would say it's even, even, sort of, even if we had a sort of um, ideal um, uh, parallel architecture, we would just not be evaluating things in the same way if we um, uh, were, because we would have, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, 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 agree that, I agree that the problem is more acute if we really, for example, have one processor and we have to simulate parallel execution by what's known actually traditionally in, in recursion theory as dovetailing. In other words, we interleave the scheduling of the execution of the, of the, of the evaluation of the two expressions. Because then you're really getting into what the interpreter is doing. Uh, now, you could argue if you have parallelism, we, we don't quite have to do that. But still, you have to sort of be dispatching things. And you still need to be able to, you know, if you get the true from one of them, to kill the other one. So it's still going to 
level of description that goes beyond the black box level. Um, so, um, and in a way, the, the, the very fact that all the languages that people actually develop and use don't do this is a compelling argument that it isn't the natural thing to do. So it raises, the, so, and, and so therefore people have indeed wanted to answer the question, how can we capture the notion of sequential functional process? So the, notice that we have now this idea of sequentiality, this idea that we will choose a particular order to evaluate the arguments in. But now you see we're no longer talking about functions or only functions, we're talking about processes because it's only processes that you can speak of as being sequential or parallel. It doesn't make sense to say that a function in the extensional sense is sequential or parallel. So we need additional information to characterize those functions which are sequential. And here is a, a, a kind of killer theorem for the hope of making this notion intrinsic in the sense that we discussed earlier. So it's a um, strong result proved by Ralph Loder um, in um, the late 90s. Um, that, that even if we take the issue of infinite computation out of things, even if we just compute over the booleans, and we don't even need then recursion, the set of functionals which we can define just in, in the sort of the, the type lambda calculus over the booleans with conditionals and uh, a term denoting the undefined um, value is not recursive. We can't decide, it, um, which is quite a remarkable thing if you think about it. There can only be finitely many of these things at each type. Um, but, of course, as you go through all the types, um, um, you, uh, there will um, uh, be more and more of them. But the fact is that we, can never, we, can, we have no re recursive way of deciding which things are definable. Now, if, if, the, if it was, I mean, the point is, if there were a reasonable intrinsic definition of the sequential functionals, then because of this finiteness, in this case just with the booleans, we could actually, um, it would imply that this set was recursive because we'd be, whatever, however we wrote our conditions, say with logical sentences with quantifiers and so on, uh, even sets and subsets and, and power sets and so on, everything would still be finite, so everything could still be checked in a finite way. Um, and therefore this structure would be recursive. The fact that it's not recursive really kills the hope of having a reasonable intrinsic definition of the sequential functionals. So the best we can do is to characterize which are the sequential functional processes, which is really an intentional notion. And this is what um, game semantics came along. Actually, in some sense, bef uh, um, actually, um, so the um, before uh, Loder's result, but making it particularly plausible that such a thing should be true. Uh, so something I was involved in with colleagues, Radha Jagadizan, Pasquale Malacaria, also um, by Martin Highland and Lu Kong, and then by many people. Uh, so it's been extensively developed as a way of answering these kind of questions. And as a way of developing an intentional theory of computation based on positive properties and yielding positive results. So let me just say a bit about, um, uh, so I, uh, do I have another what, 15 minutes maybe, or is that okay? Great, thanks. So that will be fine. I don't need to cover everything in these slides. So I want to give some, just some uh, basic impression of game semantics and some description of um, what it does. Um, so the basic idea is we go to step back from the standard extensional idea that you think of the types, the data types in the programming languages as being interpreted as sets, and then the, the, the sort of programs as just defining functions over those sets. And instead we're going to think of types of languages as interpreted as two-player games. And the idea is that the, um, if you consider any term or any expression 
then it's evaluated in an environment. Maybe it's called by some other part of the program. So, uh, we, and, and the two players correspond to the two, the two sides of this, of this situation. So the part of the program that we're currently considering, the side of that part of the program is taken by the, the proponent, or player one if you like, um, and the opponent is the rest of the world, the environment or the context within which this program is being evaluated. So in a natural way we get a reading of evaluation uh, of a program as a kind of interaction between two players. And programs are strategies, so the types will determine the rules of the game, and programs are strategies for these games. So part of this is that game semantics is then inherently a semantics of open systems because the meaning of a program is given by its potential interactions with its environment. And then um, uh, the key operation is plugging two strategies together so that each becomes part of the environment of the other. Uh, and this really exploits this. One of the things about games in connection with logic uh, and also in connection with programming languages in this way, is that they give us a different way of reading, a very sharply different way of reading uh, basic concepts in logic as compared to, say, to the traditional truth values. If you think of negation, for example, negation in truth values is flipping between true and false. So not of true is false, not of false is true. In terms of games, it's flipping the roles of the players. Player one becomes player two, player two becomes player one. That's a very different thing. It's a kind of duality, but a very different kind of thing from the traditional truth value point of view. So how are we going to see types as games? So here's a very simple example, the basic data type of natural numbers. We just think of as a little protocol, I mean quite a trivial one, where the environment asks for a number so that's this green queue. This is an opening move by the environment, sort of requesting an answer, uh, sorry, requesting a number. And then the, uh, the system replies with, the, with, with an actual natural number. Uh, so this is almost the same as the data type, we might say. But there's just this little bit of extra structure where we're explicitly distinguishing the roles of the system and the environment. And that, turn, that turns out to be a fulcrum on which we can sort of use our lever to um, uh, make, uh, make quite a lot of things happen. In particular, although this looks not very different from the basic data type of natural numbers, uh, when we form function types we get something very different to how we might think of a set of functions or something like that. What we do is we form, a, we've already got games corresponding to A and B, the input type and the output type, and we form a new game from disjoint copies of these games, where on the input side we reverse the roles of the two players, so like I was just saying about negation. If you think about a procedure that has to um, perform a computation taking inputs from A to outputs on B, then the environment can ask for an output on B, but now, in, typically, in order for the procedure to, to reply, it must firstly get some information about its input. So it's the procedure who asks the, for the information about the input and the environment that has to provide that information. So you see that in a very natural way, just in the logic of this two-party interaction, the roles have to be reversed in the, um, um, on the input side of the type. And this corresponds to the familiar thing that in, uh, in logic um, the um, um, implication order is reversed on the left hand side of an implication or so called negative context or um, we can say it's uh, contravariant behavior on that side. So here is an example which I hope will sort of give the idea. So here is a lambda term giving a second order function. So it asks for a first order function as input, then for an actual natural number. It calls the function on this natural number as input and adds two to it and returns that. So its type is, um, so here's the type of the function input, here's the type of the natural number input, and here is the output. So how would this function play as a strategy in this game and how would that look like? Well, in these games, the, the, the opponent, 
in the environment always starts off, and the environment starts off by requesting um, a number, the answer for the computation. Uh, and then how does player respond? Well, we see that the first thing it has to do is to call this function and see what output it's going to give. So that's what we do here. Notice that um, following this uh, reversal of roles that we were describing here, that uh, it, it, it now fits in with this, that it's the player that asks the question in this uh, output side of the function input. So the roles are reversed in that fashion. Now at this point, the environment uh, might ask for its input. So in other words, we're calling the F, we want the, we want the output from the F, but then um, in order to be given, uh, which we, uh, the, the F is a parameter, it's something we don't know. So, the, so what, what the context we're in may be willing to give us an output, but only if we um, tell it something about the input, because it's up to us what to apply as the input to this black box, as we were saying earlier. So the, uh, on, you know, on this side where the polarities flip again, it's the opponent that asks the question here. And, and you can see that what we're doing is actually to apply this function to our other input, this x. So when we get asked what the input is, we have to go over here. So these are all copies of the same simple game. Uh, and we're, we're sort of moving between them. So there's a kind of almost like a spatial structure across here, these different copies of the game. And on the other hand, there's a temporal structure flowing downwards. So when, when we get asked for the input to the function, we go over here and say, well, tell me what the value of this parameter x is. And now our environment has to provide us with an actual value. We just simply copy that value over, and now that's provided an input to our function parameter. And now our environment, now it's seen its request for input satisfied, has to produce an output for the function call. So that's the value of f of x here. And now we can uh, finally answer the original question by returning an output over here. So that, that is a sort of um, a typical way that we will interpret um, a higher order functional program by a strategy in a game. Of course, the way we actually define the semantics is compositional. Everything is built up uh, um, from the, the structure of the syntax. We build more complex things from simpler things. But, but this is exactly the sort of thing that we get. And here is, um, here is an example of plugging things together to get to um, apply one thing to another, um, where each becomes part of the environment of the other. This is the crucial uh, ingredient that allows us to give a compositional semantics in this uh, highly intentional game style of giving meaning to programs. So here we're taking the same second order function we had before, and we're applying it to the particular function which squares its input. So this, this lambda x, x squared, is the thing we're going to plug in for this f over here. So here is the, the, the functional we had before, and here is the actual input. And the idea is we superpose these two things, one on the other. The beautiful thing is that we reversed the player-opponent distinction on the, on the input side of this functional, whereas it stays the same for this actual first-order function we're plugging in. So they fit together hand like glove, and each becomes the relevant part of the environment for the other. And they're able to interact against each other. So interaction is inherent in this game semantics paradigm. So if we, if we start playing the second-order function as before, what it views as asking its function for uh, its function argument for input is viewed by the actual function we're plugging in as the environment asking it for its output. Um, it will then ask, because it needs to know the value of x to give x squared, it will then ask its input for um, its, the will ask the environment for its input, and that to, the, um, that to this functional here is the environment re responding to its request here by asking for its input. Uh, we now go over there. This isn't even visible to the argument. It's not, not, in the, not in the sight of that black box, of that interface to this function. We go here and get that input from the environment. And now we know what value to plug in here. 
And for us, for the functional, that comes back as the answer we get to the um, um, input side. And then the, the, um, the function here, having received its input, produces its output n squared. And we see that as over here in the functional as the answer we got from our call to the function. And uh, we're now able to give the, uh, the answer here. If you look at what's been going on altogether, this part where each becomes, closes off and, and, and acts as the environment for the other is kind of a, a, a piece of potential interaction which has become uh, actual and kind of disappears. And what's left as the remaining observable behavior from the outside is just the, um, the function we get by, by performing the, by actually plugging in this input for the F here. So it's just the th what we're left with once we, we do beta reduction and put this squaring function in for f. So we just get lambda x dot n, the squaring function applied to x plus 2. And that's exactly the behavior that we see here. In other words, this game theoretic interaction can perfectly captures the syntactic operation of beta reduction. Um, so we get this residual strategy after we hide the part where they interact which is just this thing here, which is exactly what you would expect as the simplified function we get by, by actually uh, reducing and evaluating. So uh, just to uh, summarize, so what we get out of this is that games and strategies organize themselves into a very nice mathematical structure. And we can then give a compositional semantics for a, for a functional programming language. And the beautiful positive result we get is that there's a perfect correspondence between uh, the strategies that exist in the semantic universe and the things you can define in the natural functional language. So the problem we saw earlier of these kind of things like parallel or completely disappears. There's now a perfect harmony between what exists naturally in the functional language and what exists in the semantic universe. Um, and um, there are some interesting issues about the, the kind of strategies that we have in the semantic universe for this to happen. This was implicitly something that was true in the kind of uh, strategies we were looking at here. Um, and we have to make it explicit and build that into our definition of the, of the um, universe of, ge of games and strategies that we're considering. I mean, just briefly, the constraints are typically that the strategies don't have perfect information about the previous history of the computation because in a purely functional program when you call a function with some arguments the arguments don't know anything about each other this is what's often called referential transparency the t1 doesn't know whether t2 has already been called or not whereas if we had state we could use some variables and store information in them to pass information to each other so this is actually this constraint on the strategies, the information flow between parts of the strategies, actually characterizes the distinction between purely functional computation and stateful computation. And another thing that we could see in this sort of uh, kind of strategy is that everything was nicely lined up in columns. And you can see there's this nice nested structure of call and return. So we can sort of see from this structure that there's no jumping out in the middle of some execution sequence. And this is characteristic, again, of the idea of sort of proper functional nested call return without continuations or exceptions or any of these wilder kinds of non-local control structures. And in fact, it's possible to formulate these constraints in a precise way to get this correspondence, uh, which get these powerful definability results. Um, and um, so the point of conceptual interest is that we found positive reasons why we get exactly this, these kind of constra natural uh, constraints on strategies, which correspond exactly to uh, the things that can be defined in a, in a functional language. So this is a positive story for a form of intentionality. And then by relaxing the constraints which characterize functional computation, we can actually start to capture the various kinds of effects that exist in programming language, things like state, control operators, and many more things beside. And what's been found is that this paradigm 
has proved to be flexible and powerful for constructing, again, models that exactly capture the semantic universes, the, what could be expressed in languages with a wide range of computational features. So different kinds of um, uh, evaluation order, uh, state, reference types, control features, non-determinism, probabilities, and so on and so forth. And in many, many cases, game semantics have yielded the first and often still the only construction of a, fully, of a fully abstract model, one that has this perfect correspondence between what exists in the semantic universe and what could be defined in the language for these, uh, these kind of programming languages. So in a way, this is, I think, reasonable to say the beginnings of a structural theory of processes, of uh, really talking about intentions rather than um, just the extensional point of view. So we, we can, I think, see game semantics as a, as a success story, a partial success story for intentional analysis. But there's still, there's still more things to do. I'm not, perhaps, I don't have time to discuss those things. But there's even more intentional information which um, we could still hope to access in uh, future work. Um, and uh, this is where we really look at um, highly intentional features of the structure of programs. But what we do see here, I think, is quite a lot of positive process, uh, of positive progress in understanding structural features of intentional descriptions of programming languages. So I'm gonna, uh, there isn't time to look at this, uh, which gets into the Kleene second recursion theorem. Uh, I think there are some very interesting points there, but um, we will uh, eliminate that. But I just want to, um, but let, let me just mention that um, the Kleene second recursion theorem, I don't know how many people have come across this. It's a very basic result in recursion theory or computability theory. And um, it's a remarkable example of a theorem that has deep consequences. It has an extremely simple proof. Here I give a complete proof of the Kleene second recursion theorem, where actually uh, the lines are just substitution of definitions. So each step is trivial and can be trivially checked. I mean, I've defined G like this, and I use the definition of G somewhere, and so on and so forth. And I have these combinators, and I just use the definitions of the combinators. So it's a trivial proof. The result is, is extraordinarily powerful. And nobody can understand this proof intuitively. Or at least, um, so there's some, um, I have a student who suggested some way of uh, looking at this, but it's a, it's a puzzling thing. Um, but it's a, it, it's, a, it's a recursion theorem, a fixed point theorem about codes of programs. Um, and um, uh, it's very powerful and rather enigmatic. Uh, so I think it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge for future understanding. But beyond that, we know that logicians use it as a powerful tool. It should be that computer scientists can use it as a powerful tool, but that hasn't really happened yet. Um, so, yeah. In fact, one of the simplest uh, applications of this is to produce what are known as quines. So again, think of your favorite programming language and consider how you would write a program which prints its own text out. Now, I obviously can't just write a print statement, right, because you, you're going to have a circularity if it's going to print the whole text of the program out. So there has to be more to it than that. So, uh, but from this, you get the existence of quines immediately. Uh, there's a program which, when fed in with any input, will produce as output its own code. Um, that's a very simple application of this recursion theorem. Actually, uh, the recursion theorem has been applied recently in uh, the theory of computer viruses because it's actually very good at analyzing how you can have programs that reproduce their, their own text and transmit them around. Um, so that's one example of a somewhat more uh, practical application. And there's this very nice paper by Moskovakis on Kleene's amazing second recursion theorem, which gives a tour of uh, many of the applications. So let me finish up um, with a few questions, because I think there's a lot in this area that still remains to be uh, understood. So I mean, I've reported on what I think is, could be seen as some partial progress in understanding some part of the landscape, but there's a lot more to be understood. 
Could we use intentional recursion to give more realistic models of reflexive phenomena in the sciences, in, in biology, but also in cognition, economics, etc.? So in, um, in um, uh, biology, um, uh, because of the sort of various properties of uh, self-replication and self-repair properties of DNA, um, it's been argued that there are sort of recursive-like behaviors going on even at a very basic level in DNA, but it's not very plausible that they're dealing with higher order functions. It's much more likely that it's to do with codes, because we know, after all, DNA is about codes and transmission of codes and so on. Um, but even more plausibly, if we think about um, uh, social sciences, economics and so on, we have the complication, which is not really taken account of in, mo in current economics, which may be why economic models are not entirely adequate, to say the least, that, that an economy is composed of agents who themselves have models of the system that they are themselves participating in. And there's a whole lot of feedback and recursion there. And it seems, again, much more likely that this is happening at the level of codes rather than more abstract objects. Um, so really, the, the, uh, I think there's a challenge to develop a positive theory of intentional structures. Um, and who knows, this may even uh, be the right way of addressing um, fundamental issues in giving intrinsic characterizations of computability and of complexity classes. And that may even be um, the missing ingredient to help us separate classes. Well, that's, a, that's a, no worse an idea than anyone else has at the moment. So on that note, slightly optimistic and certainly, I think, uh, pointing out some interesting challenges for the future. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you. I, I want to pause. Is this functioning? Or? Yes, it is. It's okay. Make any okay, good. Okay, so I will make a question based on maybe a comment from, from the standpoint of more like a set theoretic standpoint in a sense, because I'm for many years been working on a type free type of set, alternative set theory, which is based on the idea of, of a pro approximating naive comprehension but with, right. with, and and um, what became clear already early in the 70s was that extensionality fails in this kind of um, idea to approximate uh, naive um, uh, comprehension and so and this has been most precisely expressed in the work of Andrea Cantin in a book called truth and abstraction something like this from 1996 it's based on on work by Albert Fisser in his article mm. on the paradoxes in the handbook of philosophical logic in the 80s or something and it also goes back to this clearly clearly influenced by the second cleaning recursion theorem and, and ultimately on the Gödel, Gödel work of Gödel in, in the in the in the 30s right so the thing is that was discovered um, already by Cantini and others and taken up also in the work of Peter Hayek in his fussy set theory, which is also one way of approximating naive mm -hmm. obstruction, right? With, with an alternative uh, logic around it. Is that given this um, implementation, that you get, uh, that, that continue also isolated. Extensionality fails as a consequence, as a consequence of this uh, uh, impredicative structures that you get by approximating naive abstraction. Uh, extensionality fails as a consequence. And you get a lot of um, fixed points that go beyond the kind of fixed points you, you um, you displayed from the work of um, 
than a Scott. So w this is the basic thing I want to point out, that there, there are a lot of fixed points in, in that area from the, from this, that, uh, that has been seen from this side. That, well, that, yeah, that I mean, the, go, go beyond um, the, the, the fixed points you were pointing out. And it, it, it's connected with, with the... Well, the, the Scott is generalizing the first recursion theorem. So indeed, I was pointing to the second recursion theorem as... Uh, uh -huh. that, might, that might be a connection there. Yes. I mean, the thing is that, um, yes, well, I mean, the thing is, if extensionality fails, what does one have to replace it? Because, you know, it's hard, I mean, if you think about set theory as a basis for developing mathematics, for example, and certainly the way that's usually done makes heavy use of extensionality. So the question is, can one use it, can one use an alternative set theory in which extensionality fails in the same way? I mean, that's why I think one needs some, something to put in its place. If one, you know, one may very well give it up, but then one needs uh, This is clearly possible. For example, for example, Friedman showed in the early 70s that set theft axiomatized without, uh, with collection instead of replacement and when you don't have externality, interprets ZF. So, so, so it is possible to get the in, uh, interpretations. Uh, I think then what you do is you have you know, sort of by simulation defined internally. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's, that's so, so the, that, but then you're putting yes. extensionality back in, uh, in some sense. This is, this is true. So, yeah. but, that, that but anyway, I mean, I, I mean, I, I agree that you know one does. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting and potentially important to look at these alternative settings. But the quest should be to get plausible, positive principles that one should have in an intentional universe, as it were. And that would be a good thing, which I haven't seen clearly in things that I've seen anyway. Anyway, that's that's what okay, I wanted yeah, to. Thank you. Yeah. I do. Uh, well, thanks for the wonderful talk, full of insights and ideas and, and possible applications and open questions. Um, I wish you have had more time to go through the last part and that I could appreciate, for instance, what's so enigmatic about the proof of things. Yes. It's, you know, usually one, the feeling with a proof is that you understand what's going on. And then you see how you know how to write the formal thing. In this case, you can see how to write the formal thing, but you don't really have a feeling of what's going on. So I have, as I say, I have a student who um, has, has made an interesting attempt to do something, but I'm not sure how far they've got. You think this is related to what you call intentional recursion? That this is uh... yes. This is exactly expressing this intentional recursion, which turns out to be an amazing. I mean, although the proof is trivial, the the consequences are manifold, as in this paper by Moskovakis. I mean, I I can just uh, go back to the. I mean, this this really is the. I mean, uh, I think it's written in a in a particularly neat form in this way, where right? it's just done in terms of uh, you know, partial combinatory algebra with very simple combinators. So we just need the ability to copy data, which is what this delta does in the first step. Uh, so this is just copying. And then this is just the B combinator, which is sort of like associativity. So it's rebracketing. So it's nothing more than that, plus some definition. So there's almost nothing there. And yet, magically, we, uh, we obtain this fixed point result. Um, so, um, yeah, so I have a, uh, yeah, so there should be a way of, so again, I, another student actually has done some interesting work doing a kind of typed version of the um, uh, second recursion theorem, which you can do. And the interesting point is that the type that he gets for it is sort of involves a kind of modality which is sort of, uh, it's a bit like a sort of monad in Haskell, sort of packaging up the, 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 the intentionality. And uh, then the, the type that you get is like the Loeb's axiom in provability logic. So that's a rather beautiful thing. And, you know, maybe I think there's more to be gleaned from that. So I think, I think there's hope for uh, getting a clearer understanding. But usually, even with, um, you know, I think it's a fairly standard to say that it, it is an enigmatic result. Um, Thank you.
questions, I ask another one, uh, if I may. Um, do you think game semantics, which you advertised a yes, lot, of course, I... uh, could be used, for instance, to do simpler things, like things you seem to be doing when we're doing type inference? Could it? Well, could actually, there's been. I mean, the big, the big development of uh, in the last um, ten years or so, really, by by a number of people, including um, Lu Kong, Nikos Tsevalekos, uh, and others, um, Dan Geeker, um has been um, in applying game semantics in program analysis and verification. And this turns out to be, um, Andrzej Moravsky actually is another person I should mention. Um, so this turns out to be very nice and fruitful because this, because I mean usually with, uh, for example, with model checking and various other kinds of program analysis, it's a kind of whole program analysis has been the traditional thing. And here, you can actually, um, in good cases, you can take these simple descriptions of these kind of traces of behaviors and uh, they have a natural representation, say, as automata. Um, and um, so you can do a kind of compositional uh, representation of the semantics as little, well, maybe, well uh, as um, the kind of things you can compute with effectively um, and which are compositional. Um, and so some very nice work has been done on that. I mean, so Lu Kong in particular has really developed the area of higher order program analysis uh, using methods coming from game semantics. Um, and um, Dan Geeker has done a number of, sort of uh, things of um, that nature also, and the other people I mentioned. So I definitely, I think there's a lot of potential there and a lot of things that have actually been done and, you know, potential for more. More questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again. Okay. Thank you.